Welcome all of you who are joining us today. We can start now the webinar on investing in sustainable agriculture. How can sustainability standards reduce financial risk? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are joining us today to this webinar on investing in sustainable agriculture. How can sustainability standards reduce financial risk? My name is Cristina Larrea, lead of the sustainability standards work at ISD. On behalf of the state of sustainability teams at ISD, I would like to welcome all to this session in which we are very happy to share findings of our recently launched review, the standards and investment in sustainable agriculture and discuss with an outstanding lineup of speakers that I'm going to present in a minute. This webinar is conducted in French and English, so please select your preferred language by clicking at the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You will be able, able to speak and to listen the webinar in your preferred language. Next slide, please. The session has four parts opening remarks, the presentations of fundings, the dialogue with the speakers, and the Q&A. You are very welcome to put your question on the chat or in the Q&A function, and we will be able to address it at the, at, at, at the right uh, part of the session later on. Today, we are honored to count with our participation of five experts in the field of agribusiness, development, sustainability, standards, and finance. We have, we are very, with whom we, we are very fortunate to work on collaborate and engage with as far as our work at the State of Sustainability Initiative. I would like to welcome uh, to this webinar, Andrew Ayaku, Agricultural Investment and Technical Assistant Specialist from Asele Africa, who they work closely with investors providing financial incentives to support their role uh, investing in a small and medium agribusiness in, in Africa. I would like to welcome Ignacio Antequera, Team Leader, Technical Key Accounts, Senior Technical Expert at Global Cap. It's a well-known uh, sustainability standard who are about to uh, launch and issue the, the updated version in the coming days. I would like to welcome Lava Belardin, Director of Cooperative PACO, Agriculture and Artisanal Products of the East Coast and President of the Network of Fair Trade Cooperatives Madagascar who manage uh, an important cooperative uh, sugarcane producer, organic and fair trade certified in Madagascar, and is the one of the first uh, associations or uh, organization in Madagascar who have processed raw sugar and sell it as a value added product internationally. Welcome, Monsieur Lavala. And I would like to welcome also Mrs. Marina Erinosa, Rakotoniana, Director of the Directorate of Support to Producers' Organizations and Agribusinesses, Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock of the Government of Madagascar, who are doing a solid work on advancing a national strategy on organic agriculture in the country. And I would like also to uh, welcome the participation of Eric Cavadisa, experts on an, an, an SME development at the National Agriculture Export Development Board, NAEB in Rwanda, with whom we have collaborated to strengthen the competitive advantage of uh, Rwandan tea and coffee sectors. Warm welcome to all of you, and thanks for dedicating your precious time in being with us today. We have also with us my colleague, Natalie Bernasconi Osterwalder, Senior Director, Economic Law and Policy Program and uh, at ISD, and Vivek Bora, Senior Associate at ISD and first author of this report. Before we start with the presentation of the findings, I would like to pass the word to Natalie, who will share with us some opening remarks. Please, Natalie, welcome and thank you for sharing with us some words. Yeah, thank you very much, Christina. And I would also like to welcome everyone to this really important discussion today on investment in sustainable agriculture and how sustainability standards can contribute to increased investment by lowering financial risks for investors. Now, today's discussion, in my view, couldn't really be more timely. We are two years into one of the worst and longest pandemics in history. We are two months into a disastrous war with great suffering and destruction. And we are probably, unfortunately, at the brink of a huge food crisis with the poorest states 
more vulnerable than ever. The need for investment in agriculture across the developing world is huge and it's pressing. We need to fill an estimated $260 billion investment gap at least to meet the zero hunger target of the sustainable development goals. But we don't just need any kind of investment. Investment needs to be directed into agriculture that is sustainable, agriculture that is resilient. More than ever, has it become clear how important it is for food systems to remain viable in the face of economic vol volatility, in the face of supply chain disruptions, and in the face of the ever, ever increasing impacts of the changing climate. Today, we have an extraordinary panel uh, to discuss exactly these challenges and potential solutions. We will hear different perspectives and also have the opportunity to learn about the findings of a recent report that Christina mentioned, which we just published with IISD, examining the interrelationship between sustainable agricultural investment and business risks. The report helps us understand how sustainability standards, if designed right, can support the transition, not only towards more sustainable agricultural investment, but also more resilient food systems. The report is part of our flagship sustainability standards initiative reviews or SSI reviews series. These reports are evidence-based studies on the characteristics and market performance of voluntary sustainability standards. They aim to help supply uh, chain decision makers and policymakers navigate the very complex field of sustainability standards. This most recent report on finance and sustainability standards shows that when farmers adhere to sustainability standards and their operations become more productive and profitable, they can help mitigate environmental and social risks for investors. It shows that investing in sustainable agriculture is not only beneficial for the planet and its people, but also makes sense from a business and investment perspective. But ultimately, the successful application and implementation will depend on the design and the context of standards and the specific investment. And the report we are launching today provides recommendations on how sustainable agricultural investments can be best harnessed from the point of view of voluntary standard bodies, from the point of view of financial service providers, and also governments. But now I think it's enough for me, and I am very excited to listen to all of our experts, and hope you are too. And so back to you, Christina. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Natalie, for sharing these timely remarks. Uh, that puts in context uh, the report that we are presenting today and the dialogue that we're gonna have with our five experts in the field. So uh, we can uh, move to the presentation. Um, my colleague Vivek and myself, we're gonna present you the findings of the report uh, that we launched a few days ago. I will start uh, presenting the main risk uh, that uh, investors perceive in the, uh, in the agricultural sector and how standards are, uh, address this risk uh, as part of the findings of our report. And then my, my colleague, we will, will uh, get deeply into the uh, more specifically how each standard and standards address uh, some of these risks and can support uh, catalyzed investments in sustainable agriculture. And next slide, please. So, um, the perception of agricultural risk among financial service providers continue to be one of the main obstacles for investing in the sector, especially in developing countries. Extremely vulnerable to external shocks and exposed to agribusiness informality, the agriculture sector is perceived as a risky business. About over two years ago, 51 global agricultural investors operating in developing countries told us that agribusiness governance management practices and exposure to climate change were the three most important issues they care about when deciding where to invest. 
Next slide, please. This widespread perception of high risk and often inadequate investment readiness of a small to medium agribusiness are two main issues behind the large financial gap facing the agriculture sector. The smallholder farmers across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean are the most affected by this gap. Research suggests that they lack about 170 billion USD dollars annually to meet their farm and household needs. Next slide, please. Just to give an example of this financial gap, the next figure illustrates the, share, the small share of annual climate finance disbursements in a small scale agriculture in 2019, relative to other sectors such as clean technology and renewable energy that receive more climate finance. Next slide, please. Just to say, uh, it was only 2% the share of climate finance uh, disbursement in agriculture in comparison to the total. These financial gaps contradicts with the urgency of investing in the agriculture sector to support farmers to transition to sustainability. As we know, agricultural operations are responsible of about 20% of global CO2 emissions and 90% of global deforestation, according to recent data from FAO. There are also many human rights infractions associated to them. Furthermore, the agricultural sector is critical for the livelihoods, employment, and value generation of millions of people all over the world, in particularly in least developed countries. Next slide, please. The growth of sustainable investing certainly provides confidence for reducing this financial gap, since the strategies such as sustainability theme investing and impact investing that are more prevalent in financing smallholder farmers have experienced important growth in total value of assets under management in the period 2016 and 2020. As we see in the graph, the blue columns represent uh, the total assets under management in 2020. And we can see the growth of the different investment strategies and impact investing and sustainability investing are the two categories that are more um, you know, close to finance as smallholder farmers in developing countries, which experience important growth. Next slide, please. So getting into the meat of our session, in the report that we are presenting today, we have examined how voluntary sustainability standards can drive investments in sustainable agriculture by reducing financial risk while contributing to sustainable development outcomes. We have looked at three main aspects. The criteria that sustainability standards require producers to comply with against an analytical framework on sustainable finance that my colleague Vivek will present later on. We have looked at also seven investment cases in the standard compliant farmers, engaging with seven different investors. And we also conducted a review of evidence on how sustainability standards and investors play out, work together on the ground related to financing a small and medium uh, agribusiness. The standards on the left are some of those that we have analyzed in this report. Um, one of them, the global gap is presented here in the webinar today. Next slide, please. Let's look first at what are the main issues driving agribusiness risk. Building from Sarah's work, there are a number of economic, social, and environmental issues that can drive agribusiness risk. These issues are illustrated at the top of the figure in the first row. They include governance and management practices, deforestation and land use change, livelihoods and working conditions. Poor performance on these economic, social, and environmental issues can lead to business risk with a potential financial impact for the agribusiness, as illustrated at the center and at the bottom of the figure. This risk excludes the following, and I will explain with few examples each of them. Operational risk, for instance, when the harvest is lost due to the effect of pests and diseases or market disturbance, a change in supply, demand, or external shocks. Market risk, for instance, when buyers refuse to purchase goods associated to forced labor or biodiversity loss. Reputational risk, when adverse publicity regarding, for instance, land grabbing practices undermine the image and confidence in the agribusiness. 
regulatory risk when there is a lack of, of compliance with existing regulations concerning, for instance, zero deforestation, which can lead to facing litigation risk in the form of sanctions, trials, or fines. Failure to anticipate, mitigate, and manage this business risk can lead to important financial losses for the agribusiness, such as decreased farm revenue or increased cost. It can also lead to increased loan interest rates if all these risks can put at stake the guarantee and the return of the investment. Well, in our research, we found that standards can help reducing this, this business risks. It might not happen always, but in our research, evidence suggests that they can lower financial risk and support farmers access financing in a number of ways. I'm gonna explain the issues that are on the box ring on the right. Which are these ways through which standards uh, can reduce financial risk? Through improved business and management capacity. Since standard compliant operations are required to comply with business and farming criteria and are audited on a regular basis. Through support, the establishment of direct business relationship with buyers and the establishment of sales contracts with them that can be used as a collateral for an investment. Through operational improvements, for instance, reduced cost or improved land and labor deals. Through improved profitability, a slight increase in crop prices, the presence of premiums, as well as price guarantee that can provide <coughs> caution and savings to the, to the producers. Through reduced social and environmental risks, such as biodiversity laws, deforestation, or protecting workers' rights, as my colleague Vivek will expand and through motivating the creation of farmer groups. These were six, seven aspects that we found uh, through our analysis and research that the standards can't in occasion support reduce financial risk. Through the report, we explained these different ways through which standards can reduce financial risk and catalyze investment in sustainable agriculture. We also found opportunities for improvement, which we believe it will present later on. Next slide, please. As such, there are investors that have leveraged sustainability standards in one way or another for their investments in sustainable agriculture. In their report, we illustrate seven investment cases in the standard compliant farmers, results of the participation of seven investors in their research project, which names are listed in this, in this slide. I would like to highlight a few elements of two investment cases for the sake of time. The Mercon Group, the box on the top left, provides sustainability linking loans to coffee farmers in Africa and Latin America, coupled with a technical capacity building facility. Loan interest rates are linked to sustainability results of the coffee farmers. <coughs> Sorry, they are determined after assessing coffee practices with the use of an index, which is aligned with social and environmental criteria including in Rainforest Alliance standard. This index, the use of this index, also supports measuring farmers' progress on adopting sustainable coffee practices. It's very interesting, this sustainability linking loan, because it can favor farmers of improved loan interest when they apply sustainable coffee practices. The Moringa Fund uh, uh, is the box on the top right, provides finance and technical assistance to mango smallholders in Mali, suppliers of coma fruit, which is an aggregator and an exporter. The credit facility aims at supporting farmers diversifying revenue crops by producing other fruits and add value addition with the establishment of a fruit drying plant through which they can diversify their, their products and, and markets. The fund leverages sustainability standards in screening farmers and agribusiness related to environmental, social, and governance issues, as well as for measuring the impact of the investment. Both examples value the market differentiation and relationship that sustainability standards can bring to farmers. Next slide, please. <coughs> Overall, in our, in our research, we found that investors do leverage and can leverage sustainability standards or information related to sustainability standards in their investment activities with farmers for, with farmers for five main tasks or aspects in the investment activities. 
First one, in conducting due diligence, which means assessing the environmental, social, and governance performance of potential investees, and of course, assessing risk. Two, in structuring a financial product, for instance, providing knowledge of co-production, commercial cycles, supporting market linkage with buyers that are gonna be part of the structuring of the financial product, or as a benchmark for defining interest rates, as we have seen in the, for the case of the American group. Investors have also leveraged sustainability standards in investment decision-making in supporting the preselection and selection of investees based on the risk and impact profile, especially for impact investors that are willing to um, advance um, social and environmental sustainability through their investment. As well as in disclosing and reporting non-financial information that are, is increasingly relevant for financial service pro uh, providers, for instance, in Europe or here in Canada. As well as attracting business opportunities, sometimes uh, providing information about uh, the clients that comply with sustainability standards can open um, uh, investment opportunities for investors, attracting capital, as well as open the pool of uh, agribusiness that are willing to work with investors. Next slide, please. In conclusion, through the report, we found that there is a need, extremely urgent need, as Natalie was saying to, earlier on, to move the agricultural sector towards sustainability. Farmers, women, men, small and medium-sized agribusiness need financing to support this transition. And the standards can help lower financial risk and catalyze investments in sustainable agriculture. I pass now the word to my colleague, Vivek, who will provide more detail of this analysis of standards against a sustainable finance framework. Please, Vivek, go ahead. Thank you, Christina. Um, next slide, please. So for my part of the presentation, I will first examine the results we obtained from benchmarking sustainable finance models relative to VSS production criteria. Benchmarking is the process of comparing something to a standard or a set of criteria. I'll then examine a few high level investment opportunities based on the market performance of VSS in the banana, cocoa and palm oil sectors and conclude with the recommendations that we derived from our research. But first, I would like to make a couple of important points. First, agriculture is a risky business, but we should remember that it underpins all others. Maintaining global food security is imperative to maintain global political stability, um, as unrest or migration is often linked to hunger. If agriculture is essential to maintain global stability, investing 260 billion to achieve this is a worthwhile investment when compared to military spending, which also aims to maintain global stability. So to put this figure in perspective, the uh, US spent over 700 billion on the military in 2020, and Russia is losing 20 billion per day as a result of international sanctions against Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So the second point I wanna make is for v VSS to enable investments in sustainable agriculture, they must result in positive outcomes where they are implemented. Building the evidence base for the sustainability impacts that they are having is an ongoing process and standards can have different impacts depending on where they are applied across the world. Organic farming, which has been around since the early 70s, finally has a decent amount of studies conducted across the world to start generalizing on its impacts. And even then, there's a lack of organic farming sustainability impact studies in the global south when compared to the global north. Next slide, please. So to determine if and how voluntary sustainability standards can enable investments in sustainable agriculture, we benchmarked an analytical framework derived from 10 sustainable finance frameworks and credit rating factors for agricultural investments in developing countries against the production criteria of 12 voluntary sustainability standards operating in eight agricultural commodity sectors. The analytical framework we derived is comprised of seven sustainability themes and 24 sustainability sub-themes, broadly organized into economic, environmental, and social dimensions. The benchmarking results conveys to what degree the VSS production criteria cover the analytical framework by assessing how fast farmers need to implement them for standard compliance, for them to be in compliance with, the, with a given standard. 
So for instance, 100% was awarded when a VSS requires the immediate implementation of a product production criterion. The benchmarking outcomes were then overlaid with the results of a survey conducted with 51 financial service providers on the importance of addressing various sustainability issues in agriculture to lower investment risks and enable economic development impact. Next slide, please. The results shown in the next series of graphs conveys our benchmarking results. For instance, we obtained a VSS coverage of 71% for legal compliance which means that most of the VSS we examined require farmers to follow all relevant laws and regulations right away. On the other hand, very few of the VSS examined have requirements to deal with corruption and bribery, which need to be implemented over time or simply recommended, in, or simply recommended instead of required. The pink and blue dotted lines convey the importance of economic governance and business management aspects that need to be addressed to lower financial risks and enable economic development impact based on the survey. For instance, 78% of the financial service providers surveyed view the economic viability of a farming operation as highly important to lower financial risks, and 82% view it as highly important to enable economic development impact. Now, the gap between the degree of VSS coverage and what financial service providers perceive as highly important can provide insights for standard setting bodies to improve their production requirements to enable investments in sustainable agriculture and access to credit for farmers. Next slide, please. This slide shows the results obtained for the climate change, pollution prevention, and biodiversity and natural resource management themes. For the most part, the VSS examine have in place measures to conserve soils water, biodiversity, and forests, which are important to maintain agriculture over the long term. On the other hand, most of the VSS examined do not currently cover climate change adaptation and mitigation directly, which is particularly um, important for areas that will experience significant changing climatic conditions. But we must remember that many of the VSS requirements, such as soil and water conservation, can assist farmers with mitigating and adapting to climate change. When we overlay the results from the financial service provider survey, so the pink and blue dotted lines, we see that there is a mismatch between VSS coverage and financial service provider perceptions for climate change adaptation and mitigation, as well as for water pollution. Next slide, please. This slide shows the aggregated results obtained for the local communities and working condition themes of the framework. Most of the VSS examined have in place measures to improve working conditions, but they have less requirements to support local communities. Overlaying the results from the financial service provider survey, so again, the pink and blue dotted lines, conveys a mismatch between VSS coverage and financial service provider perceptions for several of the local community aspects that were examined. So a few takeaways from our benchmarking results include, so- Local communities and working conditions. So by requiring farmers to adopt more sustainable business and farming practices, such as record keeping, soil and water conservation, and maintaining labor rights, VSS offer opportunities for financial service pro providers to lower their financial risks and enable impact investments in agriculture. VSS will have different potentials to support meeting investment objectives since they exist to address the sustainability issues in the sectors they work in, which can be very different. The gaps between what financial service providers perceive as important and what VSS production criteria cover represent opportunities to better align standard requirements to facilitate farmer access to finance, Facilitating access to finance by making even slight changes to their standards could make a big difference for the viability of farming operations. VSS are mostly not oriented towards enabling economic sustainability, which is of primary concern for, uh, which is of primary concern for financial service providers. Most VSS address socioecological issues in agriculture, which can positively improve the bottom line of agricultural businesses and may be compatible with investors who want to, um, who want financial returns, as well as develop, development dividends. Next slide, please. 
So examining the market performance of DSS in specific agricultural sectors can reveal interesting investment opportunities. As shown on the image to the right-hand side of the slide, almost 10% of all bananas produced in 2018 was VSS compliant. Most of the top 10 VSS compliant banana producers experienced significant growth in production between 2013 and 2018. It's also, also useful for investors to take a look at the enabling the business of agriculture, as well as the human development indices for these countries. Um, enabling the Business of Agricultural Index, or EBA, was developed by the World Bank, and it consists of eight core indicators, supplying seed, registering fertilizers, securing water, registering machinery, sustaining livestock, protecting, protecting plant health, trading food, and accessing finance. The Human Development Index, or HDI, was developed by the United Nations Development Program, and this is used to, as a proxy to convey the level of development of a given country by measuring and combining its gross national income, level of education, and life expectancy. The EBA index and HDI of the top 10 VSS compliant banana producing countries are very high to medium, with the exception of Cote d'Ivoire. The investment risks associated with the banana sectors in these countries are relatively low. Next slide, please. At least a third and up to 50% of all cocoa produced in 2013 was VSS compliant. Except for Indonesia, many of the top 10 producing countries experienced significant growth between 2013 and 2018. The EBA index and HDI of these countries reveal that impact investors should focus on countries such as Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria. And investors looking to mitigate their risks are better off focusing on countries such as the Dominican Republic and Peru. Next slide, please. Approximately 15% of all palm, oil palm fruit produced in 2018 was VSS compliant. The e EBA index and HDI of the top 10 VSS compliant producing countries reveal that impact investors should focus on countries such as Papua New Guinea and or Honduras, and investors looking to mitigate their risks are better off focusing on countries such as Colombia and Malaysia. Next slide, please. So, Based on our analysis, we generated recommendations for financial service providers, standard setting bodies and governments. The recommendations targeted to, towards financial service, service providers include, first, developing preferential investment and loan programs that could be tailored to farmers with different resources and capacities who are looking to adopt standard compliant practices. Second, VSS sustainability compliance and impact information could be leveraged to educate and train investment officers on the social and environmental risks associated with agricultural investments. Third, um, develop investment products for VSS compliant operations such as certification bonds. Fourth, financial service providers can leverage VSS to address social and environmental challenges. Development impact investors can support the expansion of VSS in areas that can benefit most from their implementation. And lastly, financial service providers can develop specific financial support programs for farmers to become VSS compliant, which can expand their customer base. Next slide, please. The recommendations we came up with for standard setting bodies include, first, VSS production criteria could be better aligned with financial service provider requirements for farmers to access finance, such as requiring record keeping of the farming business that provides a history um, on profitability. Second, establishing a robust evidence base resting on independently conducted VSS sustainability impact studies in agriculture across geographies and sectors will be invaluable to attract investments. Third, establishing real-time farm monitoring systems can provide product traceability and transparency, which can also support farming decision-making and operational course corrections for sustainable outcomes. Fourth, diversify revenue generating activities of farming operations to improve farming resilience to unforeseen disturbances, shocks, and stresses, which will become increasingly important within the context of climate change. And lastly, provide guidance documents, uh, training and extension services for farmers to access financing and avoid being exploited by financial service providers. Next slide, please. The recommendations for government agencies include, first, establishing clear land tenure, especially for women, can encourage farmers to adopt more sustainable agricultural practices. 
land tenure is fundamental to access financing and attract investments. Second, governments can help farmers organize into formal associations and support their transition to VSS compliant production by offering extension services aligned with VSS and FS and VSS and financial service provider requirements. Third, governments can attract agricultural investments by improving the infrastructure that supports agricultural production, as well as enabling commercial readiness, farming value addition programs, and VSS compliant production. Fourth, governments can set up business relationship platforms to enable joint contracts among VSS compliant farmers, investors, and buyers, which could also be leveraged to establish blended finance models. Fifth, governments can offer guarantees to VSS compliant farmers to cover part of their loan default risk and provide weather related or weather based insurance to protect farming operations against changing weather patterns. And lastly, central banks could encourage financial service providers to invest in VSS compliant operations by offering them lower taxation, regulatory capital reserves, or collateral requirements. Next slide, please. So now we would like to engage with our esteemed panelists on three discussion questions. Um, and we encourage, again, we encourage our webinar participants to type uh, their questions in the chat window during our dialogue. So we've allotted 10 minutes per question. Uh, so we ask our panelists to be as brief as possible with your answers. So the first question we would like to ask is the following. What are the most important investors, private and public, and within the private and public sectors, um, what are the most important steps that investors need to take to accelerate investments in sustainable agriculture, targeting small and medium agribusiness in developing countries? So to open the discussion, I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Andrew Ayaku, Ayaku um, to share his thoughts on the question before we open it up to the rest of the panelists or the rest of the panel. Um. Thank you very much, Vivek and uh, Christina, uh, for, for this uh, elaborate piece of work um, in the sector. Um, to to kickstart, I'd like to say in my days in banking, when a client provides a certification certificate from a VSS body, it gives confirmation to the lender or the financier that the business knows what it is about and therefore has been given a certification. As you rightly pointed out in your research piece, undertaking a VSS assures the bank, reduces the risk of the financier, and more importantly, it improves profitability of the lender. Why do I say so? A research piece that my organization carried out indicated that lending to agri-SMEs is not profitable. And one of the reasons why it is not profitable is the cost of reaching out to the agri-SME, the cost of serving the agri-SME. Most of the times you have to visit the agri-SME two or three times to be able to make a credit decision. However, the presence of a VSS certificate reduces the travel time, it reduces the amount of due diligence that the lender has to take in order to make a credit decision. And so to accelerate financing to SMEs in the sector, I will encourage any investor first to understand the business of the clients. If you understand the business of the clients, then it reduces the amount of due diligence that one has to take. It also reduces the level of risk that you are taking if you understand the business of the clients. And finally, it encourages you as an investor 
to know what exactly and what support to give that SME or entity. If you do not understand the business, you may end up giving a wrong facility to the business. So I think I'll, I'll pause here and uh, hear from my other colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your perspective. Um, yes, and that, I'd like to invite um, Mr. Lava Bellarmine um, to share his thoughts, because it would be interesting to hear from, um, from a producer or a director of a cooperative on, on what Andrew shared, and also to share his thoughts on the actual question that was posed. Bonjour. Good morning. Hello. On peut bien vous entendre, allez-y. Oui. Yes, uh, we can understand you. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for having me for this uh, seminar. I am the director of a cooperative that was created in 2009. My cooperative has a biologic, uh, biological certification at the fair trade. Um, we work with the sucrocane, sugarcane, sorry, In, uh, we have also um, a um, branch uh, uh, that works on sugar cane, and it is um, easier to be assimilated by producers. We have the body for, uh, for management, the cooperative, um, and also for, for uh, establishing a relationship with producers. Um, I, also for the responsible the consumption, so that they can make more production and they can have available to them the means of production that are sustainable and that protect the environment. And thanks to these consumers, the cooperative can increase uh, year after year and also bit by bit uh, its capacity of investment. We have uh, started with a capacity of 2% uh, percent an annual, and now we have a small unit that is capable of uh, producing sugar on an annual basis. So it is thanks to our fair trade and biological certification that we have been successful in doing so. We have also complementarity in um, as regards this biological certificate and fair trade that let us have access to investments that have helped us uh, create values. This is in a nutshell our experience as a cooperative. Thank you very much. Um, je voulais juste uh, reprendre la question, Monsieur Bellarmine. Okay, uh, Mr. Bellarmine, I would like to re uh, go back to the question. Et, et, voir, uh, et voir avec vous, comment est-ce que les investisseurs ont pu vous aider so, à agrandir how can votre, uh, votre, uh, votre entreprise agricole? Uh, enlarge votre 
uh, you, your business, your agricultural business. We have two, which are the main ones. So the fact that the structure has a clear governance, that means that each member has its role to play and that ensures uh, transparency. And number two, we have the certifications of uh, fair trade and biological one. And these certificates let investors know that uh, the cooperative works in a fashion that is in line with the vision of contributing to the environment and also uh, following the vision as regards the local savoir-faire or know-how. And that is why it's easier to have uh, this structure. Great, thank you very much to both uh, Andrew and and uh, and Ms. Mr. Lava for their um, thoughts on the question. We we heard you know in terms of uh, accelerating investments in sustainable agriculture um, that vol uh, voluntary sustainability standards can have a role, both from the perspective of uh, uh, you know. Uh, um, finance service providers, and also from a uh, representative from a cooperative, how certification programs can help in facilitation, facilitating that. Um, so now in the interest of time, I'd like to move on to our second question, um, which is what are the critical interventions that voluntary sustainability standards setting bodies can undertake to strengthen small and medium agribusiness investment readiness to attract capital for sustainable agriculture. And I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Ignacio Antequera um, from Global, Global Gap to, um, to share his thoughts on that. And also, um, again, Monsieur Lava Bellarmin after Monsieur Ignacio has uh, shared his thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivek. Uh, congratulations for the very nice presentation as you have done. I'm, I'm looking really looking forward to to put my hands on the report. Regarding the the, the questions uh, on the on the critical interventions that we as voluntary sustainability standard uh, developers can do to accelerate that investment. On the one hand, you, you have mentioned uh, that uh, voluntary sustainability standards can help de-risking or do help de-risking uh, farming. And, 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 uh, uh, and one of the key things that we can do uh, is to provide transparency to the impact of the, of the implementation of our standards. Uh, so the, the results of that implementation is visible uh, by the financing uh, companies no? for, the, for the investors. This, uh, when they have transparency, they have visibility on what producers are doing, what they are achieving, the way they are working, uh, this provides trust and this uh, takes fears away. Uh, that certainly is something that we, uh, from the uh, uh, for for us uh, as as owners of sustainability standards, have um, can play a role. How can we do this? Uh, well, there are multiple ways. Uh, uh, basically, um, the way uh, that we approach this is through uh, public databases where producers do register, or we have uh, the registration of, of, of producers uh, with the results of the, of the audits, uh, with the status of their certificates, and the public can have access to that. That, that transparency gives, gives real value to the, to the uh, or strengthens the program from the trust point of view. That's really great. Um... I'd like to, to take up what, you, what you've mentioned, the importance of impact and measuring impact of uh, implementation and tracking that information and, and um, basically recast that, what you just shared into a question for, for Mr. Lava Bellarmin to ask basically, um, uh, based on what Mr. Antequera shared, um, the process of tracking impact 
from a farming cooperative perspective. How difficult is that? How feasible is it? Um, perhaps some of the challenges associated with actually, um, you know, implementing that on the ground. If you can share a few thoughts, that would be great. Oh, I'm not sure if uh, my question came through. Can you repeat it, uh, Vivek? <clears throat> sure, sure. Um, this is this is basically what I'm hoping that Monsieur Beller Bellarmine could I answer. Think he's not in the call. Okay, we he might we might he might have dropped off. So I, I'd like to open it up to the rest of the panelists actually to comment on. Uh, what Mr. Antikera shared with us. And also uh, the question that I had posed to Mr. Bellarmine is also relevant to the other panelists in terms of, of, you know, perhaps not from a farming cooperative perspective, but at least let's say from a government rep. We'll be able to answer that question. Maybe let me um, have a quick bite. And that, then I can pass it on to my other colleagues. Great. So um, at Aseli Africa, um, <clears throat> we take impact very seriously. And so is the tracking of it. And so we have developed a database, uh, which is a customer relationship management tool that allows first for the lenders to self report on the various impact areas. So our impact areas include climate and environment, food security and nutrition, youth inclusion, and then gender inclusiveness. And so we have criteria that makes an SME that is given a loan qualify or not qualify for any of this. For example, on the gender inclusiveness, we use the IFC gender report, uh, reporting requirements to measure that. Beyond the self-reporting, we also have persons that have been trained and certified who do an on-farm or SME level um, audit. So we have an organization, for example, like APRESET in East Africa, who goes around to ascertain if indeed the climate and environment um, criteria has been met. And so this audit allows us to really check and confirm if indeed what the, the SME said it was doing and was reported by our lender is indeed the case. And some of these SMEs have also been geolocated on a map that allows us to pay surprise visits to ascertain what is happening. And so we are confident in our system and that gives us comfort, especially in tracking the impact. In fact, we value impact even ahead of the investment that goes to uh, the SME. And so far, the results have been encouraging. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that inter intervention. Can I, can I just follow up with a question on if you've received any feedback from the farmers that you interact with on the ground on your tracking systems and the, I guess, the level of effort from their perspective needed for you to have that level of transparency on the ground? No, we, we haven't received any feedback. I must confess that the initiative is getting into its second year. So maybe uh, it is too early to call. Maybe from year three onwards, we will be able to, to gauge that. But these are systems that the SMEs have been practicing already. And so um, it is easy for them uh, to, 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 to do, and it's also easy to track. Great. Does anybody else want to weigh in on the, on the question that was posed? Regarding the, the effort, um, uh, I think, well, this morning, um, listening to a producer, um, he was telling about, about the, the certification of our standards, saying that he, uh, they appreciate the approach that we are taking in, in risk-based uh, 
and more efficient certification because they want to go back to the farm to the to to harvest to to the activities rather than working behind the computer you know recording recording uh, their activities is something that farmers uh, are not used to uh, they are getting used to this because of these kind of systems but they they certainly do prefer spending their time on the ground, on the farm, working on, on, on harvesting on, on their on their crops, right? Uh, it's challenging for for many of them. It is it is challenging uh, because they, it's something that they they need to get used to. Uh, they often uh, require assistance to understand how to efficiently uh, register these these uh, activities that they uh, do on at farm level, right? So. Uh, any tool, any help we can give them to make this uh, recording uh, more efficient is, be, is going to be very much appreciated by them. Great. And I think this all ties in together into, oh, sorry, Christina, did you want to mention something? No, no. no. Okay. And I think this all ties in together into, um, you know, the whole idea of, of investment readiness. If farmers are able to track their their impacts, uh, it can help attract investments and and that kind of thing. But that's not without, of course, some effort on their part. And um, and and I guess that's you know incumbent upon uh, us to to ensure that whatever systems are in place that it adds value for the farmers in addition to you know all the other actors in uh, agricultural supply chains. Um, so I'm going to move on to the third question. Um, Maybe, um, yeah, please. Yeah, this is Eric from uh, Great. Rwanda. Yeah. Great. Maybe yeah. one of the experience I've seen in terms of uh, uh, implementing this uh, kind of standards is whenever farmers have uh, a kind of support, they implement, especially when they are in the groups, uh, individual farmers uh, individual farmers, it is complicated, but when they are in the groups, uh, we have been supporting some of them uh, and some of the projects we implemented. And what we see is when they are in the groups, we, uh, they manage to implement or they, they set up a part of the group that implement this kind of standard and they are produced uh, benefits from uh, some premium, some premiums, and we have been seeing it as a, uh, as a maybe uh, helping uh, farmers to start having a sense of what the standard is and what uh, it can lead to. But again, looking at the number of the farmers, the smallholders, uh, it's kind of uh, uh, complicated to have this kind, of, this uh, standard implemented at a large scale. So, uh, what I'm proposing is, uh, uh, can't we kind of tie them to some of these existing extension systems? Because <coughs> this is a kind of practice that. Uh, uh, people need to implement uh, existing organization like financing sector or, or even the government sector. They need them, but they can. They are not affording to 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 invest in them. So uh, it's something coming. Uh, I'm thinking loud. So can we tie them to existing uh, systems like? extension systems where um, maybe uh, they can be in the, people can have them at a large scale. Uh, that was my thinking. Thank you. Thank you. That's very um, insightful comments. And, and actually that's been, um, we've had some reflections internally at IAC in terms of the need to establish a support, almost like a support structure around uh, farmers and farming systems, so kind of an ecosystem of, of actors that are able to support the um, the the agricultural production in, in each country. So that's, that's your point is um, well taken. Uh, so I'd like to move on to the third question that we'd like to ask, which is, what are the easy things that can be most readily done 
by governments in producing country to accelerate investments in sustainable agriculture, targeting small and medium agribusinesses. And I'd like to first invite Marina Herishoa uh, Rokatonianena uh, from um, the government of Madagascar and Eric Kabayiza. Uh, from Nayab Rwanda to share their thoughts. So we'll go with Marina first and then we can hear from Eric. Merci beaucoup de m'avoir passé la parole et bonjour à tous et tout d'abord toutes mes félicitations. Thank you very much and congratulations on this research that is extremely enriching. I would like to mention a few points that we've put in place in Madagascar, especially concerning judicial norms, uh, especially for the buyer sector. As a matter of fact, there is a law on agriculture, the principle is anchored in the judicial sector to promote biologic agriculture. And the idea is to facilitate local consumer the access to those products. So what we have done, we have put in place at the heart of our ministry, a uh, commission to put in place those measures favoring biologic agriculture. And there is a program with mitigating measures concerning pesticides, insecticides, in. We have also instituted through this law, the National Commission for Biologic Agriculture. It is mixed. There's a mandatory part. We have some guarantee measures. And we have also started to elaborate a strategy for biological agriculture. The objective is to see how we can increase certified biological agriculture and how to develop our national market. We want to improve our governance system regarding biological agriculture, put in place more subventions, more access to financial means. So we are still building this up. We are also focusing on means of communication and I would also go back to the question we mentioned earlier. So we have to see how to work with the certifying entities in order to ensure that the VSSS are put in place. We also have to focus on capacity building and help all actors. There are many sustainability measures existing in Madagascar. But we have especially focused on bio. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and Mr. Eric Kabayiza, if you can share with us your thoughts, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, then let me maybe. Uh, Thank you. Speaker for the 
the way I see the way Madagascar, is it Madagascar that has, has set up uh, laws that uh, especially guide uh, biological or organic production, that is very interesting. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe what uh, what I can share with you is that I will not go far from what she said, but what the government do, does mainly is uh, setting that um, that regulation and investment climate that support uh, the sectors. Uh, for example, uh, what I see the favorable policies uh, that give or provide incentives for the implementation of these sectors for anybody, a farmer, an investor, uh, uh, favor or attract investment in this sector. Uh, I've seen uh, the levy of imports duty for products or uh, any inputs that uh, is used in the, is required for implementing these standards is very important. Uh, tax holiday for investment in a kind of uh, agriculture that implement this uh, practice is very important. Again, uh, for government projects, uh, we have seen that uh, when you include kind of matching grants for business or agri business that are implementing this sec these uh, standards, Again, it helps a lot. Uh, we have been having some project uh, having uh, components with matching grants for supporting uh, agribusinesses that implement uh, either organic standard, global gap, or, 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 or rainforest alliance, or any similar standard. Uh, and it helps a lot to attract uh, agribusiness companies in this sector. Again, there is a, a need of capacity. We, we, we see that though we, as a government has, have done those, but this sector is very unknown to the large public, I can say so. So uh, there, is, there is a need of a lot of awareness we know that uh, there, there are different environmental laws, but uh, the environmental laws are aside, but the sustainability, the sustainability standards uh, uh, have requirements that are not known to the large public. So uh, we need as a government or as a public sector, a need to invest in it. Again, there is a need of any financial window uh, Government project alone cannot finance this uh, sector. Like previous speaker, some previous speaker mentioned, we need in financial sector to have financial windows or products that uh, should give a favorable condition to this kind of, to agribusiness sector that are involved in this uh, implementing and this standard. Maybe for now, uh, those are what I see that uh, can help to advance in this area. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your thoughts, uh, Mr. Kabayiza. Um, I think that uh, I'd like to sincerely thank all our panelists for sharing your valuable thoughts on the questions we posed. Um, and I'm now going to turn it over to Christina to. Um, to, to yeah, lead the rest of the webinar. Excellent, thanks very much Vivek and thank you all for uh, very timely thoughts uh, that you share on the questions that we propose. I would like to you know, pick up a few aspects that were said, uh, for instance, the, the, the important role of governments in supporting capacity building of farmers, in raising awareness of uh, uh, sustainable production and consumption in uh, developing the national markets uh, as well as linkage with uh, with buyers i would like to highlight also the uh, the role that uh, the standards could have in strengthening the governance as well as trans of, of, the, of the business the agribusiness, business as well as transparency of relevant information including impact information which could be 
critical for investors as we, we have seen in the report and, and in the dialogue. And for that to happen, it's important to, to support farmers to, to understand these, these indicators, these impact data and the value also for them in order to track the, the, their progress to advance sustainable practices. And we also heard about the, the, the relevance of creating new financial products that can address uh, the needs of uh, uh, farmers to transition to sustainable agriculture and the possibility of uh, standards to, to support uh, reducing these transaction costs. Uh, for uh, for boosting uh, catalyzed investment. Um, well, uh, I, I, we're going to have uh, we're going to spend five minutes more. We are uh, over the, uh, the the hour. We're going to spend five minutes more on this session. We have a few comments and questions here to share. Uh, I would like to share um, one comment and a question that came through. I mean, certification includes some cost and and, and, and it's, it's an important cost for farmers and agri business and. Uh, um, uh, and investing with low interest rates, as some as some investors are doing, you know, providing concessionary interest rate to uh, agribusiness and farmers that are advancing sustainable products is an option to support uh, addressing this uh, increased cost on certification. However, uh, we have a question on how buyers and other actors in the supply chain can support farmers in, in sharing this cost um, uh, of, of certification. Perhaps this question we can address to, to uh, Mr. Ignacio Antequera. Any thoughts on that, on your experience with buyers, global gap certification and supporting farmers coping with that? Yes, um, we one one of the things I, I, I do work uh, quite a lot with with retailers and and, and uh, global retailers and companies that buy everywhere. And one of the things that they they I like doing with them is is working on on projects that they they uh, collaborate to helping the farmers develop their practices, not improve their practices to be in compliance with their requirements, which is usually the certification of, of one of the sustainability standards, right? Um, they do uh, partner with producers and, and in this way, building a stronger supply chains, more resilient, more robust, and, and uh, a longer term relationships with, this, with these producers. This is something that certainly uh, the, uh, they do uh, when, when uh, opening new, new markets. Okay. Very good. Um, so this relationship can support also coping with the, the, the cost of certification. Mm -hmm. um, very good. We have another uh, uh, question coming from a, a colleague in Africa. The uh, designation of origin, you know, there is this, this label that sometimes accompanies other labels such as, you know, organics uh, or global gap and others. Um, um, designation of origin, like a, a product coming from Africa, a product coming from a particular region, Madagascar or, or Rwanda, could that add value for uh, catalyzing investments? Could that add value to increase investment? Maybe that question could be addressed to Andrew, Mr. Andrew Ayaku. How do you see this, the evolution of um, labels uh, the, 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 uh, highlight the origin of the product? Is that useful, valuable for investors? Um, yeah, yeah, to a large extent, it could, because some geographies and countries are known to have some special climatic condition, some particular soil types, and so are better suited for some produce. And so tagging a product as, let's say, coming from the highlands of uh, Rwanda, for example, will, will give it an impetus that this is a premium coffee and so could attract something. Yeah, so I think to a large extent as an investor, that, that could play a role, though not essential. Yeah, okay, um, very good. Uh, we have another question here, uh, perhaps to you, Vivek. Uh, in, the, in the slides that you presented, gender, you know, uh, gender issues either link it to uh, workers' conditions or community development was not seen as very important for financial service providers. Why do you think that, or can you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's not that it was not seen as important. It was simply that uh, the survey that we conducted, we didn't ask that specific question. Uh, so we didn't have the data to actually plot it on the, on the graphs that we had, uh, but we nevertheless decided to look at the VSS co coverage of that particular uh, sub-theme within our framework. Um, but the only reason why we didn't have the 
uh, survey results overlaid is because we didn't have the data to um, to basically plot it on on the graph that we produced. Okay. Um, further information on this survey is available in the report. I think we also identify areas that uh, I think uh, investors are still uh, need to, to be more aware of the potential uh, value of, for instance, uh, you know, um, improve working conditions at the, at the, at the, at the farm or, or the factory. Uh, how this translates into uh, reduced risk and positive impact. We also uh, look at some areas that um, um, there are still um, pending for investors to, to know about the potential risk and positive impact of good environmental and social practices. So more information is available in the report on that. Um, another question that I would like to ask to Andrew, I mean, we, we, we have seen like, um, uh, uh, investors such as the American Group and others that are moving towards uh, offering concessionary loans to farmers uh, um, based on sustainability research. What, what do you think, uh, you know, can drive or what is needed for investors to offer this type of products to, uh, to farmers that are willing to transition to sustainability? In your experience dealing with investors and, 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 uh, and financial service providers. Yeah, a couple of things will uh, drive this, this behavior. First, we do know that most investors and your study did show that businesses that indulge in sustainable agriculture tend to attract premium and do well on the market. So the market has demonstrated that it pays to be sustainable, to, uh, to, it pays to be a sustainable agricultural entity or to be tagged as friendly to the environment. That said, every entity, every investor wants to be known and acknowledged as being ESG friendly. And all around the world now, large investors are moving towards supporting this kind of entity. In order to encourage more businesses to do this line, I think my colleagues have mentioned that it's important to build capacity for these uh, agri SMEs. It is important for them to keep records so that they are, they are able to attract investment. Another part of the investors, I think beyond having uh, a friendly um, interest rates, maybe I'll take it a step further to say, as um, I think Eric was the one who mentioned, that governments encourage more entities that support this sector by giving them tax rebates, reduction in uh, excise duties, et cetera, so that it is a total package and people are encouraged to support entities in that uh, environment. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. And uh, to finalize, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to do a, a final round of uh, interventions of all our speakers. If you can share one thing, one takeaway of this session uh, th that can support, a key takeaway that can support increasing investment in sustainable agriculture, what would that be from the government perspective, standard perspective or investor perspective or producer perspective? What is one takeaway that would you recommend? Look, this is important in order to invest in sustainable agriculture. Let's just start with, uh, perhaps with Eric uh, in Rwanda. And uh, uh, what I think, uh, are you getting me? Yes, we are getting you. Okay, thank you. What I, get, what I think is the most important to facilitate investment in this area is having the policies and the, the regulatory framework that facilitate investment in the sector. Any incentive, any regulatory framework that provide that would help to move or to at the level of government to facilitate uh, people to come in this sector. That is what I have seen that is the most important in yeah. this. Thank you. Very good, Eric. Thank you. Incentives for investors, such as the one that Andrew mentioned above tax credits, could be 
you know, and other policies could support that investment in sustainable agriculture. Very good. Let's go to Marina in Madagascar. One thing that you consider is critical to move investment in sustainable agriculture. Yes, very specifically, uh, uh, for example, natural resources uh, and also existing infrastructures must be uh, supported. And for example, we need to have mechanisms uh, uh, for providing uh, support for developing sustainable projects uh, accompany, um, accompanied by uh, development. Okay, very good. So setting the conditions, infrastructure, capacity building to drive that investment. Very good, Marina. Um, excellent. Let's move to uh, Monsieur uh, Lavala. From Madagascar, is one recommendation that you think to increase investment in sustainable agriculture from your perspective as a producer? Lava. Mm. I think you're mute. You're mute. C'est bon? Voilà. Yeah, bon. Bon. Okay, we need to implement a fiscal policy uh, uh, for um, so that investors are attracted to investing in sustainable agriculture. We need a fiscal system. Yeah, uh, I think that will contribute enormously. Excellent, excellent. Again, the incentives come again. Uh, very good, thanks, Monsieur Lava. Uh, let's go to uh, Andrew, Ghana, Kenya, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I will encourage governments to set aside special purpose funds to encourage investors, especially financial service providers to tap into that, to unlearn to agri entities. It could be in the form of a credit guarantee or a grant, a matching grant that encourages the financial service providers to lend to the sector, but at a reduced rate um, and at generous uh, terms. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Thanks very much, uh, Andrew. And finally, Ignacio. Uh, give us your, your word on this. What is one takeaway that you think, one recommendation for increasing investment in sustainable agriculture? Yes, well, from my point of view as standard owner, one of the critical aspects is, is that uh, there is a clear framework uh, of uh, requirements that would be, let's say, accepted from the voluntary sustainability standards uh, to um, de-risk uh, the, the agricultural activities. Um, you have done a the work. There's a lot of standards, sustainability standards out there. Producers uh, pick one of them. We sh we need to avoid duplications and uh, asking them to do more and more certifications. That's something we need to to work together in in avoiding. Um, and there, but there needs to be a clear framework of what would be accepted, what would be those requirements, and at the same time, those with the requirements need to be under, uh, in the understanding that uh, producers do these certifications not for the purpose of getting the money first, but is for providing guarantees for the market that is buying their products no? on sustainability aspects. So there needs to be also some flexibility in the in the in this framework that I said uh, for the acceptance of the these uh, uh, different solutions. Yeah, excellent. Very good. Uh, thanks, Ignacio. I think the, the point of uh, criteria requirements is something that we suggest uh, some of these criteria that might be interesting for us to adopt in the report. So uh, that's that information is there. And certainly I see your point on the importance of alignment, you know, uh, mm -hmm. between different standards so that uh, it's easy for farmers for the adoption. Excellent. So I would like to, I think we are over the time. It has been a very insightful discussion. Thank you, all of you, uh, the distinguished panelists for joining us, Ignacio, Eric, Lava, Marina, 
uh, Andrew, uh, for joining us from your respective countries in this interesting discussion. And uh, overall, thank you for our you know collaboration with you and uh, um, in in our during this report and others. And thank you all the audience who has been very engaging in the in the chat. And uh, we will follow with all of you with the recording and uh, a blog that we will produce on this. And, and looking forward to continue joining efforts to, to drive investments in sustainable agriculture and support farmers to transition in the mass needed um, uh, resilience practices and uh, sustainable agriculture practices. Um, on behalf of all, thank you very much. And uh, uh, let's say uh, if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to, to contact us. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Merci you. Bye, Bye now. Bye now. Bye. Bye.